All right, good morning once again. It's good to be here with all of you. Um, I'd like to welcome those of you that are joining us right now in our live stream or maybe watching us after the fact. We appreciate you tuning in as always and for everybody here that is in-house. Just a couple housekeeping items while everybody gets settled and situated. Um, the first thing I want to say is next month, my wife and I and our family, we are leaving for our summer vacation on the 19th, uh, 18th or 19th? The 18th of June, and so we will be out of town on Sunday, July 23rd, and Brother Ernie has agreed to preach in my absence on that day. So mark your calendars for the great Ernie Skierbeck to bring the message on, the, on June 23rd. We appreciate Ernie being willing to, to do that. Also, I will be approaching some of you probably uh, with a summer teaching calendar. Um, uh, I, I've got one, one person in particular who has came forward and expressed an interest in wanting to be more involved in preaching and teaching. And uh, Dwayne Stevenson is going through the AWI uh, Approved Workman Institute with David Reed and myself to uh, get some training behind him, and he's going to be wanting some opportunities to teach adult Sunday school class this summer, and there will hopefully be some other uh, options there. So I'll be coming along and bothering some of you to see if you might be interested in being involved in any of the summer adult Sunday school classes. So we appreciate uh, that as always. Um, Let's get going with the message. We're in Acts, Acts, see I can't talk already, Galatians 6, and we're going to be continuing talking about verse 2 a little bit. There's some questions about verse 2 that people have, so let's read verses 1 and 2 of Galatians 6 here, and we'll get started. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted." Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time. Thanks for this opportunity that we have once again to open up your word. Lord, we pray as we do so, that as we endeavor to expound upon it and explain it, that we'll allow your word to have free course, that we'll receive it as it is in truth, the word of God, and that we will allow it to work effectually in us as we believe it to be in truth, the word of God. We're grateful for all that you've done for us through Christ. Lord, we pray for those who are not here this morning for whatever reason, we pray that they would rest in your word and in your grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday, we spent a bunch of time dissecting verse 2. What I want to do this morning is I want to begin by just doing a a sort of a 10,000-foot overview, and then what I want to do is I want to address some questions that come up. Look with me at verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Two questions I've gotten over the years about this verse as I've taught on it in the past is the first one is this, should we bear the burdens of non-believers in the same way and or with the same regularity that we do for believers? That's a legitimate question. We're going to spend some time talking about that. And then the second question is, at what point does bearing the burden of another saint become enabling that saint's potentially poor behavior? Both of those are legitimate questions that would stem from an understanding of that verse. So before we get into those specific questions, I just want to get a few more. I just want to make sure we get throw the darts on the dartboard and we have a nail down a high level understanding before we look at these secondary questions. The first thing is again in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens. Paul is in the context directly talking to believers. How do you know that? Chapter 6 verse 1 says, brethren. So he's talking here to members of the church, the body of Christ, about other members of the church, the body of Christ. He's not talking here directly about believers and their relationship to the unsaved or those who are not in the household of faith, if you will. He's talking directly to believers about other believers and what the relationship is that believers have towards one another, okay? And we saw last Sunday that the word bear here means to lift up or to carry, to endure, to sustain, right? So if you are going to bear someone else's burden, you are going to help them carry that burden. You are going to help them with their struggle, with their difficulty, whatever it is that that might be. And we went through examples of that from the Word of God. The second thing we talked about last Sunday is the verb there, bear ye one another's burdens. The verb verb bear is, is, is in the present tense, the active voice, and the imperative mood. This is a command. Believers are commanded by the Apostle Paul to, in the present, actively help bear the burdens of other saints, okay? So this is a present 
active imperative, which means, again, that Paul is commanding the Galatians, and by extension us, to actively bear each other's burdens in the present. And we saw also last Sunday that burdens is a reference to a heaviness, a weight, a trouble that somebody is laden with. And the, the word picture, the illustration is that you're going to come along, you're going to help that person carry the weight of that burden. That is sort of the understanding, right? We've talked already about how in the context, Paul's talking to believers about other believers and how we should handle these situations. So we should be, as believers, endeavoring to come alongside and help other believers and to help carry their burdens. We saw that this is a one-anothering. Bear ye one another's burdens. This is part of the one-anothering concept that we get out of the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 4, 5, and 6, that we've talked a lot about in the past. And then finally, we saw that when believers, when believers serve the function and bear one another's burdens, that we so fulfill the law of Christ. And we spent a lot of time last Sunday connecting Galatians 6.2 with Galatians 5.13 and 14, and the idea of that all of the law is fulfilled and summed up in the statement that love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at that in the book of Leviticus, we looked at that during the earthly ministry of Christ, and we looked at a statement that Paul made about that in Romans 13, and what we saw is that under grace, as a member of the church, the body of Christ, go back to chapter 5, verse 13, for brethren, you've been called unto liberty. You have not been called to bondage as a member of the body of Christ. You've been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, chapter 6 now, verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There is no law against, Galatians 5, verse 23, about the fruit of the Spirit, meekness, temperance, against such there is no what? Law. When a believer comes alongside and helps another believer bear that burden, in doing so, are they fulfilling the law of Christ in that they are using their liberty not to serve self, but to serve someone else, okay? And so we went over all of that in great detail last Sunday, okay? So with that brief overview in mind, let's talk now about the two questions that often come up along these lines. So again, question number one is the following. Should we bear the burdens of non-believers in the same way and with the same regularity that we do for those who are saints or members of the body of Christ? Okay? Now, in my opinion, to answer this question, the, the short answer is no. The short answer is no. This verse is talking to believers about other believers. Okay? So the most clearest, shortest answer is no, but I think that there's more that needs to be thought about than to just say, no, you have no obligation as a believer to help an unsaved person, okay? So in my opinion, the short answer is no. We do not have the same obligation towards non-believers that we do in terms of bearing the burdens of believers, okay? All of Paul's one anothering statements. So if you look at this, if you go back to Late 2018, 2019, before COVID, I did a whole series called Bodybuilding where we looked at all of these one anothering statements that are made in Paul's epistles, right? We went through all of them. All of Paul's one anothering statements are made to believers and presuppose that the people he is addressing are members one of another in the body of Christ. Hold your hand there and go to Romans 12. Hold your hand there and go to Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 3. Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now watch verse 4. For as we have many members in one body. So is he clearly in this context talking about those who are members and part of the church, the body of Christ, okay? So verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, all and all members have not the same office. So an unsaved person, somebody who has not trusted 
the atoning death and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and His resurrection from the dead as the only payment for their sin, are they in Christ or are they in Adam? They're in Adam. They are not in Christ. And because they are not in Christ, are they members of the body of Christ? No. So he's clearly talking here about members of the one body. Verse 5. So we being many are one body where? In Christ. And every one members one of another. That verse, verse 5 there, establishes the one anothering principle. The one anothering principle is the fact that we are all members one of another in Christ. Okay? So when Paul talks about one anothering, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the reciprocating relationships that the members of the body of Christ have with each other. You do not, therefore, have the same relationship with somebody who is not in the body of Christ. Okay? You just don't. Now, that's not in my opinion. That seems to me to be the obvious statements of the Word of God. Okay? Now, they might be your friends. They might be your family. They might be people that you care about. Um, but if they are not saved, they are not in the body of Christ. Okay? Go back to Ephesians 6. Or, sorry, Galatians 6. So the second thing I just want to point out again here is the context, okay? Notice again chapter 6, verse 1. What's the first word? Brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So you're ta- Paul's instructions are to people who are brethren. They are believers. They are people who are saved members of the body of Christ. That is the context of the instruction. So in the context, as uh, as addressing brethren or members of the body of Christ and instructing them how they ought to act and behave towards each other or towards one another, okay? Now, let's just think about this, all right? Those who are outside of Christ or still in Adam, still dead in trespasses and sins, are not saved, they're not regenerated by God the Holy Spirit, Okay, those who are outside of Christ are coming at things in their lives from an entirely different system of values. The unsaved do not approach life the same way that believers should approach life. Believers should be approaching life and relationships through the prism of the Word of God and how the Word of God would teach you how to think, function, and operate in the details of your life. Believers are not a part of Christ, they're not spiritually regenerated, they're not coming at life from the same uh, presuppositions, from the same starting point that you and I are as members of the church, the body of Christ. They don't value and esteem God's word as true and therefore containing truth. So that right there is a very different way of approaching life. Okay, I say this all the time. You should not be surprised when the unsaved do things that unsaved people do because that's what they do. What should grieve our hearts as believers is when believers treat people the same way as unsaved people. That is a problem, right, as far as conduct within the church, the body of Christ. But as as far as the unsaved, they don't value and esteem God's word and therefore they do not acknowledge his word as truth. Now, you think about all the ripple effects that's going to have now on how they think about societal issues, social norms, politics, now on and on and on down the line, right? I mean, we are at a point right now in our society where we fundamentally don't, any, don't know anymore the difference between male and female created he them. That is one of the most fundamentally basic statements that's made in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. God made humanity, and he made them in male and female, created he them, right? That's a basic building block of, a human, of, of all of human society, yet that is now questioned in our day. And I use that as an example. That is grieving to our hearts as believers when we see that sort of thing, but on the flip side, should we be necessarily surprised by it? You should not be surprised by it because the lost are not approaching life through the values of that God would establish in his word, okay? They are following the course of the world. That's what they're doing. They're following the course of the world, and they have been programmed by the adversary to follow the course of the world. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. 
Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? Verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the believers in Ephesus, did, were they, before they were saved, dead in trespasses and sins? But upon belief of the gospel, have they been quickened, have they been made alive? Okay? Verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So before they were quickened, before they were made alive, who were they? Read verse 2. And were in time past, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Mark it down. It's a spiritual law. All lost people walk according to the course of the world. Do not expect them to walk any other way. Okay? And again, if you think I'm being mean about this, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to tell you what the verse says. The verse says, read it again, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. So the Ephesians, before they were saved, did they walk according to the course of the world? Okay? Read the next clause. According to the prince, the power of the air. So the course of this world is charted by who? Satan, the prince, the power of the air. Okay? Read the next clause. The spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Disobedience. So the unsaved, are they following the course of this world? In following the course of this world, are they following a course that's been charted by the prince, the power of the air, okay? And are they walking, are, is there a spirit that's at work in all of that, okay, that is at work in the children of disobedience, that is anti-God, anti the Word of God, and does not want to value and esteem the things that God's Word says one should value and esteem. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. So before you were saved, were you following the course of the world, and did you have your conversation in the lusts of your flesh? Okay? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as who? So the thing you need to ask, so the thing you need to understand is this, okay? Are the lost following the course of the world? Is the course of the world charted by the prince, the power of the air? Okay? Is there a spirit that now works in the children of disobedience? And the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience creates a conversation. Look at verse 3. Among whom we all had our conversation. That's not talking about just the words that come out of your mouth in conversation. That's talking about your manner of life. Okay? So do the lost have a manner of life that is in line with, okay, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience from the prince to power of the air that is following the course of this world, right? So are they walking in their conversation, in their manner of life, in a, in a way that is completely consistent with their identity in Adam? Okay. Verse 3, among whom we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now herein, I'm just going to make a side point, okay? This is why the flesh is still a problem for you and I as believers. Because before we were saved, did we give in to all of the desires and whims and wishes of the flesh? Yes, we did. And in giving in to the desires, whims, and wishes of the flesh, did we establish... Behavioral patterns, thought patterns, coping mechanisms, ways that we dealt with life in our own strength, in our own ability, in our own power apart from Christ, right? And now that we're saved, do those things tend to rear their ugly heads in our lives from time to time, right? And so do we have to take every thought captive and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and think on what's true and what's right and what's lovely, et cetera, and renew our mind, okay? So... Therefore, the lost have no framework in truth. The lost have no framework in truth to grasp the one anothering approach that the saints ought to have one for another. Now, let's just stop there. Can a lost person still do acts of human kindness? They can. Do they do it all the time? Can they still give to charity? Okay. Can they still help somebody with a car problem or, you know, the basement floods or, you know, whatever it is, right? They can still do those things, right? But they're doing them out of a different issue. They're doing them out of a different motivation 
than what we should be doing them as believers for one another. You understand what I'm saying, okay? You know that because the fir- what was Adam and Eve's first action after they sinned? The first action after they sinned was to create clothes to cover their what? Sin. Did they, did, did they, in an act of human religious performance, seek to do something to hide their guilt? Okay? So mankind, human, humanity at large, are we very capable of doing things to try to, make, to try to balance the scale, so to speak? And by the way, if you talk to a lost person... Is it not commonly thought this way that, well, if your good stuff outweighs your bad stuff, then God will let you in? Isn't that the way they think about it? Isn't that the way they talk about it, right? Well, where are they getting that thinking from? They're not getting it from the Word of God because the Word of God says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? They're not getting that thinking from the Word of God. They're getting it from human viewpoint, right? And that's not the way it works, okay? In order for God to let you in, God demands perfect righteousness. The problem is none of us have it. If we had it and we could get it by ourselves on our own, we wouldn't need Christ to die for us. Okay? So what, God, what the Godhead did is they sent the Son of God, the second member of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. He took upon himself human flesh so that he could die on the cross for our sins as a substitute for us. Right? So when we by faith apply his substitutionary atonement to our personal sin account, does God give us the very righteousness of Christ? Okay? So if you are here this morning and you've trusted Jesus Christ, do you have perfect righteousness before God Almighty? Yes, you do. Not because you're so great, wonderful, and wise, but because it was the free gift to your account through Jesus Christ. You follow that? Okay? But that's not how the lost think about it. The lost think about it as like this scale thing, right? So therefore, the local church is important and essential for believers because it's the local church where one anothering, it's one of the places where one anothering is carried out. The local church ought to be our safe place and our refuge from the world. Let me tell you something. One of, one of my fundamental approaches to ministry is I am not going to get up here with any regularity and frequency and rail on the politics and rail on the election and rail on this. You get enough of that every day, all you want. You can have your fill Monday, Sunday, you know, Monday through Saturday, right? What this needs to be here and now in our time together is a place where the Word of God is preached. And the word of God is preached, and the saints are edified, and the saints are encouraged, and they're built up in sound doctrine, so that when you leave here, you have something, you've been edified, you've been built up, you've been encouraged from the word of God, so you have something to stand on when that course of the world assails you when you leave this parking lot. You follow what I'm saying? Okay? So the local church is a refuge from the world. The local assembly is where believers can come and enjoy the fellowship and the edification of people who theoretically think like them, value the same things as them, and are endeavoring to treat each other in a Christ-like manner. The local church ought to be a light in the world where the church looks to see what Christ looks like. Okay? Now, I understand. Religion messes this up big time. What we're talking about is what a Pauline assembly should look like. Okay. Now, all that being said, believers do have a spiritual obligation to do good and to exhibit the love of Christ to those who are not saved. You do not have the same obligation towards them in terms of one anothering, but as a saved person, you do have certain obligations, scriptural obligations to unsaved people. Let's look at some. Look at, go, to Galatians, go to Galatians 6. Verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto who? All men. Is it true that one of the ways the lost see Christ in the world is through the members of the church, the body of Christ, doing good unto lost people? Okay? 
And uh, let me start over verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men. Now look at this. Especially, what does that mean? There's an emphasis there, right? Especially unto them who are of the household of what? So do you have an obligation to the lost, but do you have a greater obligation to the saved? Okay? Go to 2 Corinthians 3. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse one. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse one. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some other epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Now look at verse two. Ye, that's the Corinthians, ye are our epistle written in our hearts. Now look at how this ends. Known and read of who? So folks, if you are a believer and you are out there in the world, should unsaved people in the world? I would say that's a scriptural principle. Your li- you are a living epistle that is known and read of all men. Go to Philippians chapter 2. So while we do not have the same obligation to the lost in terms of one anothering, we do have scriptural things to think about. Philippians chapter 2 and verse uh, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? So, does each individual member of the church, the body of Christ, have an obligation to work out? Notice it doesn't say work for your own salvation. It says what? Work out. Put into practice. Put on demonstration. Put on display your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now watch, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Oh boy. Is that true? Folks, do we live in a crooked and perverse nation? We certainly do, right? Among whom ye shine, let me start verse 15 together. Verse verse 15 again, excuse me. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights where? Does the believer have an obligation to be a shining light of truth in the dark spiritual reality of a crooked and perverse nation? Okay? So do you have an obligation? Do you have a spiritual obligation to the unsaved? Yes, you do. You have an obligation from the Word of God towards the unsaved to be a light and a testimony and a witness to the truth of God Almighty. And let me tell you, that's getting harder and harder. As the culture gets darker and darker, it's getting harder and harder because what they want to do is they want to shut, they want to snuff out the light of truth because they cannot abide it. Because when the truth shines into the darkness, the darkness dissipates and the truth is made known. Okay, And the only thing that's true, the only thing that is true that you can know with 100% certainty is true is this book right here. Okay? It's the only thing. And I believe I, as, as, the, as the darkness encroaches, the darkness to me is like it's like this, it's inky. You ever have an ink pen explode and it gets all over everything? That's what's happening in the darkness of the culture. It's like a spiritual ink pen has exploded and it's just, just seeping and seething into everything going on. Okay? Verse 16, holding forth the word of life. Okay, your job 
My job is not to fix the culture. Let me say it again and say it real loud. Our job is not to fix the culture. The culture is following the course of the world. The culture is charted by the prince, the power of the air. You cannot, it is not your job to fix the culture. What is your job? Your job is to hold forth the word of truth, shine the light of truth, and let the word of God do what it's supposed to do in the culture. That's it. That's all you can do. Because you know what's going to happen if you try to fix the culture? The culture is going to take you. It's going to get you depressed. It's going to get you out of sorts. It's going to get you out of thinking and functioning the way you should as a member of the body of Christ because you cannot do it. To put on the armor of God, he says, having done all to what? Stand. Your job, my job, is to stand and withstand. That's it. Not retreat, not charge, but to stand and withstand and to be there with the truth. Notice verse 16, holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither what? You and I, let me ask you, let me reverse the question and ask it this way. If the, Lord, if, if, if the Apostle Paul were standing here today, how many of you think he would say what you need to do is you need to go take over the culture for Jesus? I don't think he would have said that. And was he living in a terrible, corrupt, Roman, pagan culture? Yes. And he never says that. He says what you do is you, verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine his lights in the world. Find out what the word of God says to do as a member of the church and body of Christ living in a crooked, perverse culture and do that and don't worry about anything else. Go to Colossians chapter 4. So we have big responsibility to the lost. Not in the, not in the realm of one anothering, but in the realm of being a witness and a responsibility. Colossians chapter 4. <clears throat> Look for the sake of time. Go to verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are where? Without. What does that mean? He's talking about without the church, without the body of Christ, those who are outside of the truth. Okay, yes, in Adam, right? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming what? The time. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time arguing with the world about worldly stuff. There's no value in it. There's no profit in it. And all it does is bum you out and make you a terrible, miserly, sad sack person that all can only see what's wrong with everything. There's a lot that's right, and it's all coming from where? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. We have responsibility. We have obligation. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 15. See that none render evil for what? Boy, in, in philosophy, this is what we call the law of reciprocity, okay? And what it means is somebody's done something to me, and so now I'm going to get what? Evil, okay? See that none render evil for evil. Unto who? Who? Any man. Whatever follow that which is what? Good, both among yourselves and who? All men. Folks, I'm telling you that some of these verses are hard for us to hear. 
because we get worked up. The, the, what, what the culture does is it stirs you up in your flesh. And it incites your flesh. Okay? And when you operate out of the flesh, do you bring forth the fruit of the Spirit? I've been studying this now for six months, pretty much, right? No, you don't. You just bring forth the, the, you just bring forth the, the, the uh, works of the flesh. You just manifest the works of the flesh, right? Notice what this says. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. It doesn't say the people you like or don't like, the people you agree with or don't agree with, the people who pass legislation you like or don't like. It says unto who? Any man. But ever follow that which is what? Just because somebody does something in a way that you don't approve of does not give you the right now to go and be a jerk to that person, scripturally. Now, your flesh is going to want to get even. Your flesh is going to want revenge. Your flesh is going to want to settle the score and all that sort of stuff, right? But that's not what the verse says. See that none render evil for evil on any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves. That would be amongst the believers, right? And then he says, and to who? All men. Folks, let me just say, I am so glad that I'm not God Almighty. Do you understand that everything that you think is wrong in the world right now, that is wrong in the culture, that is wrong politically, that is wrong economically, that is wrong on any category of wrongness that you want to identify, do you understand that God Almighty is going to settle all of that? In His time, will He settle all the scores? Yes. It is not your job, it is not my job, it is not our job to do that, it's his job. So stop carrying the burden of God Almighty and let it go and walk in love toward them that are without. That's God confirming that in the text. Go to, go to Titus chapter 3. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is the faithful saying, and these things I wilt that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Do your good works save you? No. Do your good works keep you saved? No. But are you the workmanship of God Almighty in Christ Jesus unto good works? Okay? They they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now watch. These things are good and profitable unto who? Men. So go back with me to Galatians 6.2. So we've only dealt with the first question. Remember what started us on this, and that was to what, what obligation, look at Galatians 6, 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill, so fulfill the law of Christ. The question is what obligation do we have towards unbelievers, okay? So I don't believe that saints have the same obligation to non-believers in terms of bearing their burdens. I do, however, believe that saints have an obligation before God to do good and to exhibit the love of Christ to those who are outside of the household of faith. Pivoting in the time we have left to the second question. At what point does bearing the burden of another saint become an enabling of that saint's bad behavior? Okay. Put another way, is there ever a time when carrying another saint's burden would enable them to continue carrying the burden in order to create an unhealthy type of codependency situation? In other words, they basically use and or abuse a fellow saint or saints for an indefinite amount of time for their own selfish reasons. Now let me just say, could that certainly happen? Yes. Okay. This question is more difficult to answer, but the shorter answer is yes, I think it is possible for that type of a 
situation to develop. I do think it's possible. I believe there's a fine line between coming alongside to help a saint carrying a burden and enable that saint to never put the burden down. Do you see the difference? If you're gonna help, if you're gonna come alongside to help carry the burden, it's it's theoretically temporary. Right? It's not perpetual, it's temporary. Right? To help them through it so they can put that burden down and move on, right? Not that you are now their perpetual burden carrier. The burden does not belong to the saint who comes alongside for a time to help bear it. Rather, it belongs to the one who was initially carrying it. This is why, in my mind, Galatians 6, 3 through 5, let's look at that quick. So notice he says in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then he immediately pivots now to the other person. And notice what he says. For if a man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. Then shall they have rejoicing in himself alone and not in whom? See, the issue is, in the helping of the carrying of the burden, the issue is you help for a time till that saint gets to a point where they can put that burden down and move on with their life, right? Because they have solved or concluded or resolved whatever the, bur- whatever the problem was, whatever the burden was. Okay? They, so they can move on in their own standing. Verse 5, for every man shall bear his own what? So the burden belongs to the person carrying it. The saint who identifies it comes along to help temporarily with the goal of being able to put the burden down, not stand there and help them carry it for the next 35 years till the rapture. Okay? Go back to Titus chapter 3. You can easily be overtaken in other people's stuff if you allow yourself to be. Now this verse is talking about doctrinal error, but there's potentially a principle here that might apply to what we're talking about. Look at verse 10. A man that is an heretic, <clears throat> after the first and second admonition, do what? Reject. Okay. So this verse is talking about a person who is believing and teaching false doctrine. After the second attempt to correct the error, they are to be rejected as a heretic according to what this verse says. Now. Understand, this verse is not talking about giving people two chances to put down their burden before you walk away from them without any further obligation. I've heard people use this verse to say, well, you have two chances to help somebody, and then after that, you're done. I think that would be a stretch from what that verse says. Okay? That verse is talking about you approaching somebody in a false doctrine, a a heresy that they are teaching. And if after two times of two admonitions against it, they won't stop, then you, okay, I'm out, kind of a thing, okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul does instruct the Corinthians not to company with fornicators. Okay? Look with me, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. So in the context here, it's, if you go back to verse 1 just quick, go back to 1 uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it is reported commonly that there's fornication among you and such fornication as not, not so much is named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So there's an incestuous fornication situation going on here in the context of this. And the Corinthians, are they like, Are they dealing with it, or are they, like, rejoicing in it because it's manifesting how much grace they have? Okay? They're not handling it properly according to the Word of God. Okay? Drop down to verse, for the sake of time, drop down to verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one... No, not to what? For what have I for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do ye not judge them that are within? So in other words, he's rebuking them because they have not exercised spiritual discernment in this matter of this situation in their midst in their local church. Verse 13. But them that are without God's judgment, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked what? 
did Paul encourage the Corinthians to perpetually bear this man's sin? He, in fact, he says the opposite. He's like, this guy's not, he's not repenting. He's not changing his mind. You need to do what? You need to put him out of the assembly for a time, okay? So Paul instructed the Corinthians to not company with fornicators and to put away from among yourselves that wicked person. If the Corinthians continued to fellowship with this man, they would have been enabling his what? His, his behavior. So is there a fine line between helping one bear a burden and enabling a sinful situation to continue? Okay? This means that when it comes to bearing one another's burdens, believers are going to need to exercise some discernment. So I cannot give you a one-size-fits-all answer to this. You are going to have to exercise some scriptural discernment. But what I can give you is some principles to help you make such a scenario. Come back. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6 if you're not already there. Go to chapter 6. And get also chapter 10. <clears throat> get chapter 6 in one hand, chapter 10 in the other. <clears throat> Here's what people want. They want a clear list of cut and dry things. Okay? What I'm going to say to you is that a clear list of cut and dry things is actually a more immature way to look at it than the way Paul would have you to think of it. What do I mean? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not what? Expedient. All things are lawful for me, <clears throat> but I will not be brought under the power of what? Any. Okay? Come to chapter 10, look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me, <clears throat> and all thi- but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify what? Not. So I believe to honestly, when dealing with a situation like this and knowing when to draw the line on continuing to help somebody carry a burden and not cross over now into enabling their sinful behavior, okay, I believe that honesty and prayerfully employing Paul's decision-making grid here, that's what I'm calling these verses, will help a believer discern how to handle the situation, or how to handle these circumstances. Number one, the question you need to ask yourself, is it expedient? Is it profitable to myself and or other believers? If the answer is no, then what should you do? Not continue. Question number two, does it edify? Does it edify myself or other believers? If the answer is no, what should you do? Not continue. Number three, does it make for peace among the brethren? And number four, and I think this is arguably the most important one, am I allowing this thing to have power over me? Anything that you allow to have power over, anyone or anything that you allow to have power over you, other than the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word, is an inordinate affection. You are allowing it to have a higher place in your life than it rightfully deserves. So think about this. Okay? Is it expedient? Is it profitable to myself and other believers? Does it edify myself and or other believers? Does it make for peace among the brethren and and am I allowing it to have power over me? If it does not make for peace among the brethren, you're allowing it to have power over you and it does not edify, it is not something you should what? Continue with. You should let it go. I say that like it's that easy sometimes, but you understand what I'm saying. It's not something, it's, if you've done the scriptural analysis here based upon these principles, 
and you determine that it is, let me, one more time, that it's not expedient, it's not profitable, it doesn't edify, it doesn't bring peace, and it has power over me, it's something you should not continue with. So then you're going to have to seek you know, prayer and, and so forth on how to, how to handle that. Okay? Even if, now hear me, even if you determine that you should walk away from a given situation with a saint, there's one thing that you should always do, and that's pray for them. Even if you have determined that my involvement in this situation, whatever it is, fill in the blank, <clears throat> it's not expedient, it's not profitable, it doesn't edify, it doesn't make for peace, and it has power over me, even if you determine that based on those criteria, it's not something you should continue with, you still need to pray for that member of the body of Christ. They are still a member in particular of the body of Christ, and they need your prayer. And the thing they might need more than anything else is for you to stop enabling them. You following that? Go back to, go back to Galatians. People come to me a lot, <clears throat> often, with different scenarios, and they say, what should I do? How should I handle this? And I, I do feel like often people want some sort of like canned answer. Well, let me see. You got this going on. I go to this column. Conflict. Oh, boom. That's what you should do. Life's not like that, folks. And what I want you to see in this message this morning is that what God has done is he's equipped you, equipped you in a way through the word for you, to make, for you to make your own value judgments on these things. And don't be like, oh, I'm, oh, judge not, I'm not supposed to judge. No, he that is, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, he that is spiritual judges what? All things, yet he himself is judged of what? No man. Okay? You judge things not in a high and mighty condescending way, not in a way that thinks more highly of itself than it ought, but you judge things in a way, in a reasoned, moderated manner, based upon clear scriptural principles. Let's be honest. There are many things that we do that, may, that, that, that aren't expedient. There are many things that we do that aren't profitable. Okay? There are many things that we do that don't edify. There are many things, we could maybe be doing things that aren't making for peace among the brethren, and no doubt we are doing things that allow for those things to have power over us. Addictions, behavior patterns, etc., fill in the blank. You don't need me to go through the litany of all those things. But you see, you are equipped through the Word of God for you to be able to evaluate and analyze your own life. You see that? You don't really, honestly, what we need, so I'll end with this because I'm struggling to figure out where to end, okay, just in full transparency. You remember the verse we read in Titus where Paul said, we just read it maybe 20 minutes ago, where Paul said, these things affirm how often? Constantly. Do you understand that we need constant reaffirmation of this stuff? Because in our boneheaded minds, we leave and do we forget like that fast. So what we need is constant reminder and affirmation from the Word of God about these things. Okay? So, do we have the same obligation to the unsaved that we have to the saved? No. Does that mean we have no obligation to the unsaved? It does not mean that. And is there a fine line between helping another member of the body of Christ carry the burden and enabling them in something that they should not be involved in? The carrying of the burden is temporary. It is, should not be perpetual. Lord, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time. Thanks for your word. Lord, we're grateful for these saints, both here and in person and online, who come or, and or tune in to be a part of the teaching and the ministry. We're grateful for them. We pray they'll be edified and encouraged. 
Lord, help us to have our priority. We are living in a crooked and perverse nation. There's no doubt about it. Help us develop spiritual, scriptural coping mechanisms for dealing with it. And not fall into the wiles, the ploys, the snares of the enemy. We're grateful for all that you've done for us through Christ and through your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.